Beloved, it would not be an understatement if I told you this morning that when I brought this message and, and searched this message homiletically, that I had to go before God many times because of the text that I was reading from. And I wrestled with it, but it wasn't that it, it was too deep. I wasn't going to do it. It was just I had to get, make it relevant for this time because it was so powerful. And my search brought me back here. Several times I tried to go to another, another scripture, another passage of scripture, and God kept bringing me right back to this one. There was an article that had been written in a, in a Christian periodical. It was called, it is called The Sun. And in this article on September 2018 BC, before Corona, 2018 in September, this article was written by one of the writers. His name is Tony Hogland. If you ever look it up, Tony Hogland, H-O-A-G-L-A-N-D. And it was this article that had just really blew me away as a topic. And as I look to exegete this word and understand that there will be a few small details that will be omitted, but I left those out because I have the privilege of doing so. It's writer's privilege. I didn't want to blow anyone's anonymity. But it is not the illustration that I'm trying to bring forth for you to get understanding. I need you to hold on to the message of God. What is the passage saying? sharing his word for us this morning. And it is never my intention to have you shouting in the aisles and, and, and jumping up and down and, and, and praising God. I just desire that he would use me, use me in the office that he has placed me. And I desire to be used by him in that way. All of us should always come to the house of God seeking to hear from the Lord. That's, that's always first. Expecting him to speak to our individual circumstance, whatever it is we are going through. Knowing that we have heard from the master is how we should leave this tabernacle. On your way to your automobiles, on your way home, you should be marinating in this word, thinking that truly God spoke to my situation today. Beloved, I've been sent this morning to bring a message about the end times so that you would understand how very important it is for you to know what's going on in the present time. We are in the land of the dying church. We are on our way to the land of the living. This is not it. This is not the last stop. This morning, God is sharing with us that all that we see around us has been tearing at the fabric of our nation. And there are any number of things that we could look at. There is no shortage of events that have you and I shaking our heads as to what more, what else. Things are happening right before our eyes that have been spoken of in Scripture. Wars and rumors of wars, famine, Pandemics and earthquakes all have been spoken about. And yes, they have happened before, but we see these things happening collectively at a more expedited pace. Indeed, there is no shortage of anything that leaves our hearts and our minds asking, how much longer, Father God? How long will this go on? But we, the children of the King, you and I, we hold on to our faith knowing this one thing, that Jesus is our deliverer. Amen. Amen, church. What seems to be a hot button in our society today, burning in the hearts and in the minds of the people in our nation, no matter if you are wealthy as Oprah Winfrey or as penniless as someone homeless on the street. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the nation or you have just crossed the borders. There is a nation within our nation whose citizens live in a constant reminder that according to God's law, 
There is only one race. And in that is the human race. Beloved, racism isn't a bad habit. It's not a mistake. It's a sin. And it cannot be cured by sociology. Only theology has an opportunity to break that curse. So after reading the article in The Sun, my eyes were opened a bit wider as to what God allowed me to see more clearly. And that's why I say the messages that we get, sometimes you have to resort to other publications or other Bibles to bring them into your, your mind and spirit. But pray that God will reveal these things to you. And just as he revealed them to me, he helped me to see that his mercies are new day by day. Beloved, Jesus is our deliverer. In the article, Brother Hoglin allows us to walk in his shoes and to live in his country and to join him for just one day. He writes, America, that old problem of yours, racism, I have a cure for it. Come into my country mm, and get a taste of what it's like to live where I live. Let me tell you what it's like the very first time you park your car in that cabinet's underground parkway. Step into the elevator. You probably feel as somewhat alienated and forsaken. Perhaps you feel a bit angry. Angry about thinking that you've been singled out unfairly. Plucked from your healthy life and cast into this cruel world. Beloved, wherever you are, the world is filled with distractions. Do not let the devil deceive you with the shiny thing. I've been sent this morning to carry a message, and I want you to get this message right here that the human race is the race that we are. It is not a mistake. We are here learning that God's mercies are every day. Let me tell you what it's like the first time he parked there, feeling a bit angry, understanding the ordeal. When he walked into the hospital with his manila envelope under his arm with x-rays and reaching an appointment that he had, looking around, seeing the people, the, 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 the soccer mom and the, the, the coach for the football team, the retired lineman for the telephone company, or a grandmother and a mother of three. In his world, my beloved, everyone is the same. That's what uh, Brother Hoglin is telling us this morning. There are no white people. There are no black people. In my world, we serve the God of heaven and earth. Do not be distracted. When you find yourself struggling with issues, think about what my brother is dealing with on a, a regular basis. In his country, there are no different ages, no different skin colors, no different religious preferences in the backgrounds. You know one thing that even the most educated people need what you have and what we are called to give away so freely, which was given to us so freely. From the ancient of days, the God of the heavens and the earth, the message is, and I'm glad to bring it this morning, that Jesus is our deliverer. The only race is the human race, and I wish there were other ways to cure your racism, America. But I don't see one. Frankly, I see the problem as you are immune to all types of evils and iniquities. And the problem has been installed by history, maintained by privilege. It is too robust, too entrenched to be undone by anything other than disaster. 
We all come together in times of disaster. We had an incident a few weeks ago, a month ago, with the hotel in, in South Miami had, had collapsed. And we all rallied to the cause. Those are the kinds of things that happen in this nation where we live, where we come together as one people. But after, after the dust has settled, everyone goes their separate ways. So here is what Paul was saying to me this morning. Unlike his first letter to the church, who had walked away from the protocol, Paul is writing this morning to remind the newly formed church in Corinth to hold true to the doctrine, the doctrine that he had given them before he left to Ephesus. Having had the opportunity to convert both Priscilla and Aquila, they allowed him to stay in their home while he raised a church up from nowhere. As Paul is writing him, once again, letting them know that they had forgotten God's plan for them. A lot like this morning, they had forgot to leave, walk away from sexual sins and immoralities and, and all those things that have us bound, turning away from the Christian conduct and doctrine that he had instilled in them prior to his departure not partaking in the Lord's Supper. Church, we, we have to be mindful now of, of what Paul is telling us now because the church is the institution belonging to God. And we are expected to rise to a higher level. The church is unable to be edified and to be effective when the people are not walking in the ways of the word the church will have no impact on the outside world if first and foremost the people of God, we must believe that either Christ died for us or he didn't come at all. And if that is the case, then my preaching and your witnessing is all in vain. But we believe that there was a Christ and there is a God. And how do I say that? How do I know that? Because looking at you, I know there had to be a miracle maker. Around the miracles that abound in our lives, just your very presence is proof to a dying world that there is a God. We are the paradox that exists among mankind. Jesus is our deliverer, church. In the second letter, Paul is intensely with more of a proposal, not so much of a proposal, but it's an autobiographical look at himself. He explains the importance of coming together, coming together as one body in Christ, helping one another stand, especially when we come against the enemy who will never stop trying to distract us from our primary purpose of taking the gospel into a dying land, seeking all who will ask, what must I do to be saved? There are those, church, looking for what's been given to you, the gift of salvation. We are to sound the alarm, to tell the word into a dying land that none will be denied. You have not because you ask not. Jesus is my deliverer. He has prepared for us a place where we can meet those that need to hear the gospel and invite them to have a seat at the master's table. It's all right, church, that we know that we all go through. And that's what Paul is saying. We must continue to keep putting distance between ourselves and the old man. You can understand how difficult this may have been for Paul, formerly Saul. There had to be some distance between him. But just like him, we must rise each day 
and die daily to the flesh. Pick up our cross and follow Christ. Jesus said, behold, I make everything new. Not for my sake, church. He did it for our sake. We have a charge to keep, a God to glorify. Jesus, to the unbeliever, is a deliverer. We are the evidence, church. Like Paul, you may have a rough time shaking your past, but shake it you must. We can't go about this half, half-hearted. We've got to be all in, 100% in. No longer desiring to go where my God has delivered me. Constantly telling one another that day by day to receive a fresh anointing that you are being kept by God's grace and his mercy. Not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. We know that. We work for the Lord because there is a higher reward. Not for what happens to me here, church. I'm working for Jesus. I'm laboring in the, in the vineyard, dear God. I'm, I'm picking the harvest, fellow members of the congregation, because we have a charge to keep. There is no such thing as too much God. You're, doing, you're putting too much time into this God, this God thing. Jesus can use all the help he can get. But let me tell you, church, let me drop this off for free. If you don't want to do it, He'll find someone else. Day by day, new mercies we receive. You and I have been bought with a price. Jesus came and with his fresh anointing, we are able to stand in a time when everything else is helter-skelter. The only thing that seems to make sense, the only thing that seems to be walking in one direction, is the church, the people of God. But we have to not allow ourselves to be distracted by the shiny thing because Satan comes seeking whom he can kill and destroy. Beloved, Jesus is our deliverer. While we are spending time seeking God, we are reminded here in this letter from Paul because he had a hard time walking away from his past, as you all would think. But when he came to Corinth and Ephesus, and he was a new creature in Christ. But he had to, had to make known to those that may have never heard about the Messiah and spread the news that Jesus said that there is only one way to enter the kingdom of God. Any man come to the Father must come through me. Jesus is the door that we must enter in if we plan on seeing God. Because Jesus is our deliverer. He's our reason for living. He is the reason we get up in the morning. He is the reason we sing songs of praise. He is the reason we seek him in prayer. God is worthy of your praise. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, God. you should have a praise blessing. In our text this morning, we talk about the relationship. God has blessed us in the third verse of this Corinthians. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort. We're gatekeepers, you and I, gatekeepers in the kingdom of heaven. God is our father and he is in charge of our mercies and he is a God of all comfort. I know this church because I've been there. I've seen days and times when I was filled with uneasiness. When I was thinking that maybe, maybe this ain't so. But I ask and I, 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 I tell you this morning, don't allow Trouble to last that long in your life where you just got to call out to God. When you cry out from the bottom of your heart. Because God will bring you to that place. Seek him now while he can yet be found. God is waiting for us. He's our comfort. 
enough love within our Savior for every man, woman, and child in the world. Enough for yesterday, today, and forever because he is indeed our comforter. We are here to be used by God as not just for ourselves, but for a comforter to those who are traveling this road and may have lost their way and have forgotten where the path to the kingdom is located, falling subject to the battles that are raised in the spirit world by the enemy. But if you find that someone is not receiving your gospel, then just shake the dust from your feet and ask God to send you another. Church, we are enlisted in God's army. And I thank God for your prayers. And I pray that you thank him for the prayers of the saints that are going up on your behalf. Knowing that through prayer, the power of God is moved. Helping us to walk with them as they walk through. Trials of life come when you least expect them. That's what, the, that's what, 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 uh, what Paul is, is saying here. On his way to Damascus, he had that encounter. It came all of a sudden, but when it happened, he had to yield to the voice of God. There is a peace in Philippians 4 and 7, a peace which surpasses all understanding. And it shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's what you get when you serve God. You get the peace that surpasses all understanding. Beloved, Jesus is our deliverer. Christians should never grow tired of talking about the Savior. Never take a rest. You might, you might get weary. You might rest, but don't quit and don't stop. Press on, my beloved, as we seek to do what God has called us to do. In the fourth verse, he says, who comforted us all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. Beloved, the rain falls on everyone and the sun warms all of the father's creatures and the darkness comes into each of our lives. Bible says there will be tribulation even in the life of a Christian as well as those who are in the world. The comfort in tribulation is what we're speaking about like this morning. It's having that peace that surpasses all understanding. There is a rest for the Christian, a rest in Christ. The world may be falling apart around us, but you and I can have that perfect peace that only comes with God. And it has everything to do with knowing that no matter where you are, no matter what comes, what may, that Jesus is our deliverer. The only way for me to truly understand my brother's pain is to walk a mile in his shoes. That's how you become a comforter to those that need to be comforted. Verse number five says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Beloved, when we receive Christ within us, you and I, we are partakers in the suffering of all. Romans 8 and 17 says, and if children, then heirs of the God that we serve and joint heirs with Christ, if so, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And I, I chose another text that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. It was in Galatians and Two and 20, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not me, but Christ lives within me. Now the life that I live in the flesh is because of my faith in the son of God who loved me and who died for me. My beloved Jesus is our deliverer. Beloved, the more we endure the righteousness and the suffering, the greater our reward, the greater comfort we will be to one another. We've had it happen in our own congregation. No matter where you are uh, joining us and aspiring to hear the gospel, 
There are those in this congregation that I know where I serve in this house. People are there to be a comfort to those who are, are comfortless, to be a, a friend to the friendless and have prayer for those who are unable to pray for themselves. That's the power of Jesus. And that's because he's our deliverer. He came and, and made a way for you and I. Verse number six says, and whether we be afflicted, it is for our consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. That's the body of Christ, church. That's the body of Christ. We all are in this together. God has placed us here with a purpose that we must endure. All believers need to realize that this purpose, purpose is to avoid all suffering for one another. Carry that cross with your brother or your sister. We're here to be a helping hand for those in need. The church knows the desires of the world are many, but we can't take down to that, beloved. We walk and talk to a higher calling, the calling that Jesus has called and died for us. In the seventh verse, it says, and our hope for you is steadfast, knowing that ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also in the consolation. Beloved, this is a reminder. <laughs> it's a reminder that the Lord wants us not to be lonely. <laughs> and he feels like he'll help us carry our cross because Jesus is our deliverer. The only peace he had was remembering why he had to die because Jesus has become our deliverer. He carried our sins all on his back as he crossed that mountain called Golgotha. But Jesus knew that he would be our deliverer. He did it for our sake, church. And let it not be said that Jesus did not lay down his life for anybody else but you and I because he knew that he would be our deliverer. Delivered. Bible tells me that he laid in a borrowed tomb. He had to do that, my, my fellow Christians, because there would be no deliverance if he did not lay down that tomb. Tell me in the Bible that he laid there all night Friday night, laid there all day Saturday church, all day Saturday night. But the Bible says that early on Sunday morning, like this morning, church, early Sunday morning that he rose with all power, all power in heaven and earth was in his hands early on Sunday morning because the prophecy needed to be fulfilled. Our Savior got up and rose after being on the weekend spending time saving souls in H-E double hockey stiffs. Early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up, my beloved, with all power. And not just power for you and not just power in the earth, but all power. Jesus is our deliverer. He's the one who we go to in a time of trouble and ever present help. He says in his word that the promises of God are yes and amen. amen. Jesus is our deliverer, church. Amen. amen. Jesus is our deliverer. Amen. amen. Jesus is our deliverer. God has spoken. 